So welcome everyone. Uh, this is to the Completed Life Initiative Poetry Lunch Hour debut, um, who is going to be hosted by Delano Kopru. Uh, he's going to read um, the poems of um, Amanda Gorman. And we really appreciate um, you guys being here for our uh, inaugural event. Uh, Delano, I'll go ahead and let you um, do what you do. Okay. Um. 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 Once again, um. Welcome, everyone. We're, we're very, very delighted to have you with us for this uh, hour to consider a, a bit of poetry. Um, for um, you know, it's it's noon. It's noon in New York, and um, we thought it would be a, a nice idea to open with um with um Amanda Gorman, um, the 24 year old poet out of uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, her first full volume of um, works. Um, it's called Call Us What We Carry. Um, and this was uh, actually presented to me as an idea by our um, esteemed um, program director, um, Sarah Kiskadam Bechtel, who has uh, um, some, her, some of her own events she's dealing with at the moment. Um, so um, this is um, really in, in honor of her and her, and her recommendation. Um, so just you know, so just just so you know and get a feel of the thing here, um, you know, we will I will share poems on, on my screen uh, with us, and wherever wherever we would like, we may pause and meander a bit. Um, this is meant to be a bit of a dialogue, um, and if if that happens, fantastic. Um, otherwise, if you feel like just kind of um, I'm enjoying a bit of sunshine and hearing a bit of poetry, um, we're here for you in that regard as well. So um, I'll begin to share my screen and um, let's hope the whole thing doesn't go kaput. Oh, before I forget, um, I just wanted to let everybody know if you do want to have closed caption, you can do, click the CC button on the bottom left corner of the screen and you should be able to read everything. Thanks, Delano. Okay, so um, I think this this is a really great spot to begin, um, in terms of thinking about Amanda Gorman. Um, she says of her first collection of poems, um, this book, like a ship, is meant to be lived in. And that's a uh, quite a compelling statement from such a um, young person who's full of um, fantastic wisdom here. And um, as I was kind of gone. Um, just kind of uh, thinking about the poems I've read. Um, I couldn't help but to kind of think of the echoes here of Emily Dickinson in terms of there is no frigate like a book. And, you know, this odd word that we don't use that much anymore, frigate, meaning a type of, a type of boat that you would paddle uh, with oars, things of this sort. And so Amanda Gorman has created a collection of poems that for her, um, contain and hold things they they carry weight they carry stories um for her history is a type of elegy anyone who goes about remembering details from a past life is in gorman's definition a historian so um, i'm going to just kind of take us broadly over the landscape of amanda gorman's um creative universe and then we'll swoop in for specific details. And along the way as well, um, um, there is within Amanda Gorman's work um, a, a great sense of, of connection to the to older texts, to ancient texts, um, even to Hebrew scripture. And um, for me, um, as we kind of read our read um, her poetry today, the notion of ghosts come up a, a pretty good deal. And, um, you know, we may be wondering about why ghosts. And so um, to kind of put this into context, I've got two quotes here. Um, one of them is um, from the Hebrew scriptures from Job. I alone am escaped. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And there's this sense that 
as as storytellers, we are all to some extent carrying with us stories of ancestors. And that for Amanda, Amanda Gorman, her poetry grows out of a sense of loss. And so if we, as we kind of think about, you know, what it means to live a completed life, part of this element is the notion of storytelling. And um, you know, in, for, 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 for those who know me, I'm a, I'm a 19th century literary scholar. And so um, Herman Melville always has a, a warm place in my heart. And um, that this very um, captivating quotation or, or question from Moby Dick, chapter 69, called The Funeral, um, are, you are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? It's once again, this way in which Melville, um, much like Gorman, um, much like the Hebrew scriptures, are continuing this story of language as an arc. Language is something that holds history. And just, you know, just let's kind of complete this little circuit here. Um, and we'll kind of see this in the, in, in, in the final poem we'll, we shall read today. Um, yes, language is a life raft. And this is uh, two, two quite compelling lines from Amanda Gorman herself that she writes in a poem called, What We Carry. So hopefully this right now is kind of, is giving you a broad sense um, of, of where we're going for this hour today. Uh, we will be on a journey in which we will explore the nature of story, memory, and a type of journey, um, if language is a type of arc, A-R-K, as well as an A-R-C. So I'm gonna stop sharing this portion of my screen. And um, I'm so sorry we weren't able to share the PDF with you. Um, if you would like after this, um, just feel free to email us and we will make sure you have a copy of, of, the, of the PDF that, that, that I will be reading from um, to stay within the realm of copyright. Um, I have not copied the entire collection here. I've only copied about 10 or so, and we might get to about seven, depending on how, how depending upon time. Okay, so this is the opening poem of Gorman's uh, really wonderful collection. And I'll try to expand this as broadly as I can um, to protect our sensitive peepers. So um, the first poem in this collection is called Ships Manifest. Allegedly, the worst is behind us. Still, we crouch before the lip of tomorrow, halting like a headless haint in our own house, waiting to remember exactly what it is we're supposed to be doing. And exactly what are we supposed to be doing? Pinning a letter um, to the world as a daughter of it, we are writing with vanishing meaning. Our words water dragging down a windshield. The poet's diagnosis has already, has already warped itself into a fever dream. The contours of his ship stripped of the murky mind from the murky mind. To be accountable, we must render an account, not what was said, but what was meant, not the fact, but what was felt, what was known even while unnamed. Our greatest test will be our testimony. This book is a message in a bottle. This book 
is a letter. This book does not let up. This book is awake. This book is awake. For what is a record but a reckoning? The capsule captured. A repository, an arc articulated, and the poet, the preserver of ghosts and games, our demons and dreams, our haunts and hopes. Here's to the preservation of a light so terrible. And just going back up to the top of this poem, Ships Manifest, what's particularly intriguing is towards the bottom of the first page is when, is when um, Amanda Gorman begins to outline the work of a poet. And in her reckoning of things, in her account, um, poets are the ones who, who give an account of not, was, not, of not what was said, but meant, um, not the fact, but what was felt. And even the act of writing down what, um, what was known while even unnamed. And this aspect of the unnamed part of, of, of our human existence is, is at the core of poetry in general. Um, particularly, particularly the notion that for the poet, um, it's not necessarily about just a straight reporting of the events of the day, but as Emily Dickinson said, um, to tell the truth, but to tell it slant. To, in other words, to infuse one's own light into helping others understand the meaning of one's own existence. And so this poem does some really remarkable work in that regard. And at any point along the way, um, please feel free to um, mute yourself if, you're, if you feel so called. Now, one thing you'll notice about this collection as well is that it has a particular um, pandemic ring to it in the sense that um, for so many of us, and, and as we continue to think about our, 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 our shared journey as a human family, uh, we, we're battling with the sense of being um, sheltered in place, of being home, and things of this sort. And so Amanda Gorman, you know, much like, you know, in terms of her work, the pandemic has, is, has left a mark here in a way that is very um, thoughtfully considered. And this is uh, one of those poems. This one is called, There's No Power Like Home. We were sick of home, homesick. That mask around our ear hung itself into the year. Once we stepped into our home, we found ourselves gasping, tearing it off like a bandage, like something that gauze the great gap, gape of our mouth. Even faceless, a smile can still scale up your cheek, up your cheeks, bone by bone, our eyes crinkling, delicately as rice paper as some equally fragile beauty. The warbling blues of a dog, a squirrel venturing close, the lilt of a beloved's joke. Our mask is no veil, but a view. What are we, if not what we see in another? And those last two lines have a particular resonance. Um, our mask is no veil, but a view. And with that one line, um, Amanda Gorman opens up the possibility that there is still a viewpoint to be had. We are not complete, com completely hidden. And the challenge of the poet now becomes how to see how to define what you're seeing from this new angle of vision. And she takes it a step further in the final line of this poem. 
by unpacking what it means to have such a view instead of letting the mask separate us she is letting the mask unite us what are we if not what we see in another and we'll kind of see this this notion play out throughout this collection of of, of, of poems for this for this afternoon as well as throughout her collection um as as, as we all know she um was the was the inauguration poet for President Joseph R. Biden Jr. And in that sense, in that regard, um, her most important pronoun is we, particularly in her in her poem, The Hill We Climb. There's a sense that for Amanda Gorman's vision of, of humanity, it is one in which we we are we are unified. And this really comes shining through in the next poem I've selected for us today called Memorial. And you'll notice right next to this is another really powerful poem called Pre-Memory, which is um, about the Holocaust. And this is, this is a very long poem. Um, um, if, if, you're, if you're interested in reading it, um, feel, free, feel free to reach out to me. Just in the interest of time, um, there was not enough time to really cover this one. But Memorial is, um, is one that captures a lot of the art of storytelling in a way that's pretty, um, pretty, um, pretty lyrical. Memorial. When we tell a story, we are living memory. In ancient Greece, the muses, the dainty footed daughters of memory were thought to inspire artists. It isn't knowing, but remembering that makes us create. This would explain why so much great art arises from trauma, nostalgia, or testimony. But why alliteration? Why the pulsing percussion, the string of syllables? Is the poet who pounds the past, it is the poet who pounds the past back into you. The poet transcends telling or performing a story and instead remembers it, touches, tastes, traps its vastness. Now, only now can memory, previously marooned, find safe harbor within us. Fill all these tales crushing our famished mouth. And this poem is such a wonderful reminder of, 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 the, of the place of song and of poetry in the, in, in our, in the most ancient of, of humans um, to, the, to the present day. This idea of the, of the poet or the bard as the storyteller, as the holder, of stories of an entire people, of an entire nation. And Amanda Gorman uh, does transcendent work here in evoking that bit of a lost past. Um, unless, unless we're regularly visiting the uh, marble monuments of, of Homer and Virgil um, and Catullus, we may have forgotten that um, about the power of story itself, that as she so as as Gorman puts it so well at the very opening of this, when we tell a story, we are living memory. And the the ambiguity of living um, is living a a verb, um, or is it an adjective? We are living memory, um, and 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 I I love the nuance of that particular moment here. Um, but also too, it's quite intriguing. And this gets down to the notion of, of, of history. It isn't knowing, but remembering that makes us create. Um, you know, often, you know, often I tell students that all writing is creative writing and they look at me as if I've sprouted two other heads, but this is kind of the point um, that we're all somehow weaving and stitching 
together meaning. And um, the poet um, is, is a maker, is a builder. And um, Amanda Gorman in this poem captures a bit of that resonance as well. Much to consider here. I could spend all afternoon on this one. Just moving us a little bit further along. Um, and this, you know, again, earlier I mentioned the notion of ghosts, and this is where it becomes very prevalent, um, is that in this poem called, titled, Who We Gonna Call? And um, those of us here may remember, you know, that 1981 blockbuster Ghostbusters um, and, and, the, and the Ray Parker song, um, Who We Gonna Call? Um, and of course, you know, Ghostbusters. And so, in many ways, uh, Amanda Gorman is um, is supremely playful in this collection. Um, you know, for you know, for for those of the younger generations, there are some poems that occur as text messages with those little bubbles. Um, I didn't include those here, but but she's she's constantly playing with language, and this is the the role of the writer, that the willingness to 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 be adventurous in in storytelling, and in how language is being used. In one's own time, but the but the epigraph here, um, it's by Cameron Awkward Rich, who's a, a professor at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, very provocative question: What is writing, but the preservation of ghosts, but the preservation of ghosts? Um, and so, using that as a launching point, um, Gorman begins. We rouse goes primarily for answers, meaning we seek ghosts for their memory and fear them for it just the same. Our country, a land of shades. Yet there are no race but us. If we are to summon anyone or anything, let it be our tender selves. Like ghosts, we have too much to say. We will make do, even if in a graveyard. We, like this place, are haunted and hungry. The past is where we pull home, our forms once again fluent in all things bright. Quite a powerful poem here. And that third line, um, the, the, the line before the penultimate line, the past is where we pull home, absolutely has uh, cadences of, of Scott Fitzgerald, um, the great Gatsby. So we beat on you know, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past, as the great Fitzgerald put it. Um, but the, the past is where we pull home is a very evocative line, largely because Gorman is suggesting that to some degree, um, each of us in our own way, when we think of home, it is sometimes not in the future, but something that we've left behind. And this, this goes back to her point of nostalgia that she mentioned earlier and seeing how ghosts memory, nostalgia all play out here. It's quite an evocative poem. And she's building up a theme here in terms of how can language hold memory? How does, how does language work as a tool that makes any of us who use this language um, historians to some degree? So who are we gonna call? Um, it's a very open-ended question now. Yeah, I thought I'd take this opportunity to um, open the discussion briefly and see if anybody, feel free to unmute yourself, raise a hand or write something in the chat. Um, if you have any comments, thoughts. Yeah, there's, there's no quiz on any of this. So uh, feel free to have at it. Um, this one, I will just read this one. 
it's pretty it's pretty uh, it's a pretty lovely poem at times even even blessings will bleed us there are some who lost their lives and those who were lost from ours who we might now re-enter all our someones summoned softly the closely the closest we get to time travel is our fears softening our hurts unclenching as we become more akin to kin as we return to who we were before we actually were anything or anyone that is when we were born unhating and unhindered howling wetly with everything we could yet become to travel back in time is to remember when all we knew of ourselves was love We'll let that one sit for, for for about 10 seconds or so, maybe longer. Um, definitely uh, one worth thinking about. And um, one thing you'll notice as well in this in this in this collection um, by Gorman is the, um, the the theme of love and hate is kind of pairing. And um, and we could we could think about our role today. Um, and I think you know Robert Frost. Um, you know his fire and ice poem kind of figures comes to mind here when the great frost said some say the world will end in fire some say in ice um and 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 here um for frost fire and ice um were metaphors for a type of rage that was kind of running over the world and it could be either hot or icy cold um for gorman here the word that she's um, exploring is hate and unpacking hate and seeing how hate and love play out with one another. Um, and even you know, towards the very end of this very, very end of this poem, um, it's when she says, that is when we were born unhating and unhindered, howling wetly, um, little babies, right? We all had um, our own, own moments with everything we could yet become to travel back in time is to remember when all we knew of ourselves was love. Back to the past. It's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, she, I think she's, uh, um, you know, she has really challenged my thinking in many, in many fantastic ways. Um, what you're seeing before you now are, are, um, are two, sm two small poems. One is actually is right from Hamilton. Um, I did not know this until yesterday when, the, when some of my students um, broke out into song when they heard this, when they saw this poem called The Letters. Um, it was nice to receive such an enthusiastic reaction in, in class. Um, um, so we have not taken the joy from the hearts of the youth, which is great. Um, but just right, right here is another little poem called Erasure. And this is, um, we'll just get into it since it's here in front of us. Um, but the point of this idea of this poem, and this is um, um, pretty interesting idea, is that it's not through the point of the pencil, but through the eraser that we can create meaning. Um, and so this is uh, the idea of turning poetry upside down. Um, some of us may even know, you know the pleasures of taking a, a black Sharpie on an old page, blacking out some words and finding a poem within a page. Um, and so Gorman is playing around with this idea here um, when she explains the idea of erasure poems. And we actually need this because uh, one of the poems we're going to read next is called um, Letter from a Nurse. And in Letter from a Nurse, Gorman took a historical letter and found a poem within the letter itself. So 
Um, so very quickly, erasure, as Gorman explains, several of the following are erasure poems, meaning there are documents with, with their pieces plucked out, just as someone will call this the gone year, the long year, the glove year, the unlove year. The key to constructive and not destructive erasure is to create an extension instead of an extract. It's not erasure, but expansion, whereby we seek the underwriting, the undercurrent beneath the water surface of the words. And you Wolfians out there, as in Virginia Wolf, will appreciate that idea of, of, of the words having a type of surface or, or words being a type of water or type of waves that we have to plummet beneath. It is to keep the words from drowning. Hereby, the pen looks to enhance, evoke, explore, expose the bodies, the truth, the voices that have always existed, but have been exiled from history and the imagination. In this case, we erase to find. Okay, let's see how that works. So this is um, an example of an erasure poem. Letter from a nurse. And um, just a you know, quick footnote, let me go back here. Let's see if it will let me zoom in on that. The very bottom here, to her friend at the Haskell Indian Nations University, Kansas, October 17th, 1918, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's the origin of this letter, and this is the erasure version of it. Everybody has to die. We consider ourselves lucky. Believe us, we were there, and yet we intended staying. Home, a whole string of things we can't begin to name. Oh. The first that died sure unnerved us. Sunrise is such a horrible thing. And yet every day we are called and waiting. If fortune favors us, we may find ourselves. Squeeze the life out of our hand. There is so much to be said. We don't believe we should ever get through one normal year. Maybe we remember now all the schools, churches, theaters, dancing halls, etc., are closed here also. There is a bill in the Senate. We can't help but hope. Ha ha. If we are not dead, right. Right to be, to do, to. And it's quite remarkable to consider that this erasure poem from over a hundred, this poem, this letter from over a hundred years ago was erased. And we find a letter from a nurse as a poem composed originally in 1918 that could very well be of our current time. One thing here that um, I love that, that Gorman does, she also plays around with mourning. And so with this particular poem, um, there's this little line here. Sunrise is such a horrible thing, and yet. Um, 
And she takes this notion of the sunrise and a little bit later in a poem called um, The Miracle of Morning, she subverts this idea. And this is um this is one this poem has a lot of great rhyme to it, and uh, and the the mood here is it's a little different. Um, you know, this you'll recognize this to be a somewhat cheerful poem. The miracle of morning. We thought would awaken to a world in mourning. Heavy clouds crowding a society storming, but there's something different on this golden morning, something magical in the sunlight, wide and warming. We see a dad with a stroller taking a jog. Across the street, a bright-eyed girl chases her dog. A grandma on a porch fingers her rosaries. She grins as her young neighbor brings her groceries. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we can weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. So on this meaningful morn, we mourn and we mend. Like light, we can't be broken even when we bend. As one, we will defeat both despair and disease. We stand with healthcare heroes and all employees. With families, libraries, waiters, schools, artists, businesses, restaurants, and hospitals, hospitals hit hardest. We ignite not into the light, but in lack thereof. For it, for it is in loss that we truly learn to love. In this chaos, we will discover clarity. In suffering, we must find solidarity. For it's our grief that gives us gratitude, shows us how to find hope if we ever lose it. So ensure that this that this achieve this excuse me, so ensure that this ache wasn't endured in vain. Do not ignore the pain. Give it purpose. Use it. Read children's books. Dance alone to DJ music. Know that this distance will make our hearts grow fonder. From these waves of woes, our world will emerge stronger. We observe how burdens um, braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let each morning find us courageous, brought closer, brought closer, heeding the light before the fight is over. When this ends, we'll smile sweetly, finally seeing in testing times, we became the best of beings. So this particular poem is, um, is um, quite a shift from how so many of us maybe have experienced these times, but it, it is it is a joyful reminder of the miracle of each morning. Um, and and Gorman um, really um, uses uh, everyday imagery to kind of bring a certain light to the world here. Um, and and I, and for me, I think that the the notion that you know, one thing about about poets is that um, when there's a break in the rhythm or the structure, it's always nice to pay attention to those moments 
And here we have all these uh, quatrains or little four line stanzas happening. And this little, these two lines here, this little couplet say a lot. So on this meaningful morn, we mourn and we bend like light. We can't be broken even when we mend. And this, um, this notion of the light issuing forth from darkness is um, what Wolf, Virginia Woolf herself mentions um, in the waves. I just wanna kind of bring this quote to our attention, um, a little, some words to put in our, to our back pocket. Um, as Wolf wrote in the waves, now let us issue from the darkness of solitude. And this play of light and dark is, is a very much a part of, of the craft of, of one Amanda Gorman, but also of, of artists in general, as the poet, much like any sort of artist, is always seeking to order chaos to a degree. And for Amanda Gorman, um, this comes through in the metaphor of light. And so um, I'm gonna have to turn around my little um, little screen here because one of these poems um, has a has a view of something that we've all seen, right? These little symbols of the mask. And, um, and Gorman plays a lot with form here. She has a lot of shape poems and this one is particularly intriguing. And this one also kind of brings light to the fact that, that we, we've all shared an experience that was um, to many, in many ways, um, both the, the divisive, but also from a certain slant could have been um, very unifying. And here she really wants to unify us. So anonymous, we stumbled sick with shame, groping for each other in that heaving black. We were mouthless for months. We could have been grinning. We could have been grimacing. We could have been glass. And so we must ask, who were we beneath our mask? Who are we now? that it is trashed. The great question of identity and whether or not the mask is actually trashed is uh, still one that's um, unfolding as we speak. But this notion of, of again, um, the, 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 uh, the pronoun of choice is we, we stumble. We were mouthless for months. We could have been grinning. We could have been grimacing. And this poem connects to the earlier poem about what view do we have from our mask? And can we still see ourselves in the other while we're masked? And so at the core of, of Gorman's poetry as well is this theme of compassion. Um, can we see ourselves in others? And how do we connect in general? Okay, time to flip it back the other direction. So this is the final poem of, um, of the collection that we're gonna share today. It's called What We Carry. But I just wanna pause for a moment to see um, how we're doing. Um, if there are questions, comments. There was a comment from team Tim Dean um, on the other poem previous to Anonymous, sure. uh, The Miracle of Mourning. And he says, like, light we can't be broken even when we bend mm. like and also i think there were some reactions to the poem of uh you know on a heart emoji so these are quite fantastic collection yeah and you know one thing about you know one thing about poetry in general um is that um you know we, we forget how good it is um we can get really busy 
in our days, but one thing that poems often do is really require us to pause for a moment, to pay attention. Um, and this is, um, you know, one one story that was underreported, in my opinion, um, you know, as the pandemic um, continues to kind of um, take its shape, is has been the boom in poetry, and um, and I was really considering why would so many people be writing poems, and um, and 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 I'm kind of reminded of what uh, Voltaire uh, mentions in, in Candide, um, the notion of cultivating your garden, and and the notion too that. Um, sometimes when things are so bleak, um, it is the, 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 the idea of poetry and of beauty, these type of things become absolutely essential. Um, they, they, they are essential because they help shape and find meaning for all of us. And so, um, and so I'm glad, I'm glad we had a heart emoji here. Um, so, um. The, the final poem I would like to share with us today, and I'm, and I'm already looking forward to, to what we'll do next month. Um, this poem is called, What We Carry. As kids, we sat in grass, fished our hands into the dirt. We felt that damp brown universe writhe, alert and alive, earth cupped in the boat of our palms. Our eyes wax wide with wonder. Children understand. Even grime is a gift. Even what is mired is miraculous. What is marred is so marvelous. Ark, a boat that which, a boat like that which preserved Noah's family and animals from the flood. The word comes from the Latin word arca, meaning chess, much like the Latin word arcere, to close up, defend, or contain. Ark can also mean the, tra the traditional place in a synagogue for the scrolls of the Torah. That is to say, we put words in the ark. What else to put them? We continue speaking, writing, hoping, living, loving, fighting. That is to say, we believe beyond disaster. Even endings end at the lip of land. Time arcs into itself. It is not a repeat but a reckoning. Days can't help but walk two by two, the past and present, paired and paralleled. It is the future we save from ourselves, for ourselves. Words matter for language is an art. Yes, language is an art, an articulate artifact, Language is a life craft. Yes, language is a life raft. We have recalled how to touch each other and how to trust all that is good and right. We have learned our true names, not what we are called, but what we are called to carry forth from here. What we do carry, if not what and who we care for most. What are we, if not the price of light? Loss is the cost of loving, a debt more than worth every pulse and pull. <clears throat> we know this because we have decided to remember. The truth is, one globe, wonder flawed, here's to preservation of a light so terrific. The truth is there is joy. That is to say, whoops, 
in discarding almost everything. There is joy in discarding almost everything. Our rage, our wreckage, our hubris, our hate, our ghosts, our greed, our wrath, our wars on the beating shore. We haven't any haven from them here. Rejoice for what we have left behind will not free us. But what we have left is all we need. We are enough, armed only with our hands, open but unemptied, just like a blooming thing. We walk into tomorrow carrying nothing but the world. Quite a stirring poem Beautiful. by um, by a um, by a twenty four year old from Los Angeles. Um, she uh, put pen to paper in a very um, profound way. Um, I'm hoping you're walking away with a little bit of hope and joy in your heart. And um, um, Nicole, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I was I would welcome anyone to unmute themselves. Yeah, do you want to? Um, to talk about uh, anything here. I see Eileen uh, wrote extremely powerful. I agree completely. Uh, this is a wonderful, I think she's amazing, this poet. Yeah, and I um, think too, you know, if we don't want to ruin the mood um, by by rigorous analysis, that's fine too. We can we can let the poem sit and live, breathe a little bit. Re resonate. Yeah, for sure. We have a few more minutes, so we'll just um, stay on in case anybody wants to comment on anything. Do a sound check. Can you hear me? Yes. I wanted to see if you could take us back to that second po I think it was the second poem about um, happy to. sick at home and then homesick. Sure. I felt like that I was picking up such strong uh, images of the racial reckoning work and frankly lynching imagery, but I didn't I didn't catch it and I, I don't want to miss that. It felt so strong. There's no power like home. This yeah, one? yeah, that's the one. I mean, this this poem is uh is something special, and um, I think where it becomes really interesting is when she begins to um really zoom in on the details of of what we all look like <laughs> um, with masks, and we're trying to communicate with our eyes. And I thought I thought I saw a word once called. Um, what was that one word? Smile with your eyes, smousing or something. Um, the English language had mutated into a new form, um, as it as it often does to accommodate um, new things that were happening. But I think here, even faceless, a smile can still scale up your cheeks, bone by bone, our eyes crinkling delicately as rice paper, at some equally fragile beauty. The warbling blues of a dog, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, the, 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 and then this view, of course, our mask is no veil but a view. And um, you know, there's always, you know, at, you know, in the in the in the back of our minds, um, and maybe um, um, was it was it Tim um, that was that, that brought this to our attention? Um, no, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's "We Wear the Mask" is a uh, is a pretty. Um, one might say visceral poem about um, wearing a mask, but meanwhile, underneath that mask, you're suffering. And he's talking about the African American experience, which can also be, for many of us, a type of universal feel in terms of, like, you know, how, what, what are the faces that we prepare to to meet the faces that we meet to kind of um, riff off T. S. Eliot there, that 
that somehow a mask can be this sort of external um, protection, but beneath it, what's beneath it all. And, and we have Amanda Gorman as well, kind of playing around with this notion. However, we have an actual mask that we were, that we all wore and continue to wear, um, depending upon if we're in New York or elsewhere, so. Yeah, are there, are there other um, elements, other little parts we should revisit? Um, I think we've got four minutes, so we don't wanna leave yeah. anything out. I'll click the unmute all so that you feel free to go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Should you wanna comment on anything? And there is no pressure, by the way. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll wrap up for us. Um, you know, there's so many great poems here. Um, I would, I wouldn't, you know, I would encourage each of us, if we're not already doing this, to begin to craft some poetry. Um, it's, it's not um, anything beyond anything any of us can do. Um, but I would suggest that one one line that really stands out to me is how she's kind of describing the poet as the one who is a type of historian, essentially. Um, this notion of the poet is one that's um, quite interesting in the sense that um, within any work of art, within any sort of poem, there's a contained world and a contained history that wants to be saved, as it were. And, 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 and even in our own writings, whatever form that takes, we're participating in the process of, of history and memory as well. And, and just you know, to closing out this little element of, of a light so terrible is not you no know, bad lighting, but it's one that um, really enhances or creates a feeling of awe in us that um, that when we're kind of writing and recording, we're participating in one of the um, great human milestones in terms of sharing a bit of our life, a bit of ourself with others, so that um, so that we can continue to communicate across the generations. That's one way of looking at this. And um, I think those particular lines um, truly resonate um, with us here at the Completed Life Initiative. So I'll let those kind of sit with us. And um, we're looking forward to having you with us again next month. We'll, we will send details along. Um, Nicole, I think we're right at the time. We are. So um, thank you guys, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it was really powerful. I think we all felt it. Uh, I am Nicole Nettall, a member of the board, um, filling in for Sarah today. And thank you, Delano, for being a wonderful host and a good reader um, and interpreter. I'm looking forward, as I think some others are, and getting the book. Um, I will uh, do my best to send out the PDF of these readings to everyone who registered and um, really appreciate you all attending our debut event. And with that, how oh, I see Donna has raised her hand really quickly. I guess to have a quick. Did we did did you have a question Donna? I think she's gone. Okay, thank you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. See you Thank next you. time.